Hello, welcome to the Comic Book Commentary. I'm Bo Leidig, and this week we're going to be talking about a very short-lived, but in my opinion, a very underappreciated comic book. It's Wildstar number one. So let's zoom in and take a closer look. Before we get started today, I'd like to apologize in advance for any throat clearing or my voice sounding a little bit strange. Uh, pollen season, unfortunately, has arrived early this year, and my sinuses are not happy about it. First published in May of 1993, we see here that Wildstar does have the uh, signature chromium look of the day as the Wildstar logo and the character's eyes are in the reflective silver chromium. Uh, overall, I really like this cover. It, it's very simplistic in terms of only having four colors on the front of it, but it really does pop out at you. And I can imagine that seeing this on the shelf in 93, it would have really stuck out amongst the rest of the books that were surrounding it. Al Gordon, co-creator, writer, inker. Jerry Ordway, co-creator, penciler. Ruben Rood, colorist. John Workman, letterer. Bill Bud Shakespeare, editor. Ali Optics, color separator. Uh, we can see here on the first page of the book that Wildstar is sifting through rubble, looking for something very desperately in the future. We're not really sure how far into the future, as it is just listed as tomorrow. So it's anybody's guess at this point. Uh, we see he's been dealing with some battle. He's being pursued by others. And this is one of the few complaints I have. It doesn't really make sense, a lot of the blood spatter that's on him. Uh, I can understand it coming from, you know, inside of his mouth or in his nose. But this is not a costume he's wearing. It's an actual symbiote that covers his body. So either the symbiote's not doing a very good job of protecting him or the symbiote itself is bleeding, but it's not really clearly explained. We see that... He's in a hurry. He's worried about the fact that he's pushing the symbiote too far. And then he happens to see what he was looking for in the rubble, which is a time machine. Unfortunately, he has no time to celebrate as he is attacked from behind by one of his pursuers. Uh, this is where I should point out his powers come from this star that you see on his chest, which is actually a parasite. And this is a common theme, not only for him, but some of the other characters in this book, as we're going to see on the next page. Here on the next page, we see that Wildstar has been caught by the pursuers. There's quite a few of them. However, they're not all named right away. This is Free Zone. This is Death Star. This is Trans. And this is Jumpstart. However, we don't know necessarily who the rest of these characters are, just that they're after Wildstar. Uh, Jumpstart then decides that she's going to go in and finish things off with Wildstar. Uh, she doesn't want to kill him, though, as she seems to have an attraction to him and wants him to reciprocate those feelings. As she approaches, she believes that he's just down for the count and is going to give him a swift kick to the face. However, he was just playing possum as he grabs her foot and throws her up against a block wall. After catching Jumpstart on, off guard, uh, Wildstar wastes no time in pressing his attack as he jumps into action and uppercuts whoever this guy is because he's never named. However, as I stated before, many of these characters have a parasite that is... Uh, assumedly doing something for them, as Wildstar then grabs this guy, puts him in a chokehold. Deathstar and Trans plead with him to stop, but Wildstar proceeds to rip the parasite off of his face, which takes all of the skin from his face along with it, which is awesome, and then throws the parasite to the ground. The parasite then tries to escape. However, Wildstar decides to use his Force Blast to kill the parasite. Unfortunately for Wildstar... His Force Blast is not something that he can just do continuously over and over again, and now he's in a position where he is still severely outnumbered and not able to use his most powerful attack 
as the rest of the group decides to close in. Once again, Jumpstart approaches Wildstar, thinking that it's safe to do so, trying to get him to join up with their group. However, he decides to instead punch her square in the face, knocking her backwards, as he does still have super strength, but again, unable to use his Force Blast at the moment. This knocks Jumpstart over a pile of rubble, and she lands next to the next character we meet, who is Hotwire. For whatever reason, they make a real point about her being stunned to see him and upset that he's there, but we're never really told what Hotwire's motivations are for being there or why he should be there, as he apparently is only a kid, a teenager, I'm guessing, and he does work with the mercenaries, but again, to what extent, we're, not, we're never told in this issue. Uh, we then see another member of the crew get knocked over the rubble. This guy's name is Mazer. It does not appear that Mazer has a parasite on him, although it's possible that he does and it's just covered by his clothing. Uh, there's a fair bit of character lore that is not fully explained. Not all of these characters are fully fleshed out in this first issue. And there's a bit of banter between Mazer and Jumpstart. However, they're interrupted when Hotwire is bringing to their attention something that he finds disturbing that's going on in the battle behind them. We then see here on the next page that Hotwire was looking at the battle going on between Death Star and Wildstar as Death Star seems to have had enough and is pressing his attack, trying to defeat his weakened foe. He then decides to use what apparently is his own Force Blast, but it doesn't work. So he takes off his helmet, and we then see he has a Parasite which has taken over one of his eyeballs. Uh, he's very upset because his Parasite is not giving him the power that he needs to project a Force Blast to, I guess, kill Wildstar. And he then pulls it outward from his face, and we see it dragging his optic nerve along with it. Pretty gruesome. However, Wildstar takes the opportunity during his distraction to counterattack and crack Death Star straight across the face. He, however, then has his leg frozen by Free Zone. This doesn't slow him down, however, as he kicks her in the gut, then presses the attack again, goes after Trans, and whoever this guy wearing the green armor is, because his name is never told to us during this issue, we then see another member of the team jumping up towards him. However, he catches him in midair, punching him in the gut, and then decides that he has to use this lull in the battle to try and use the time machine that he's found. He then takes a what he refers to as floppy disk from underneath his symbiote, that is supposedly going to recalibrate, recalibrate the time machine to allow him to use it to travel through time. Here on the next page, we see Wildstar inserting the floppy disk into the time machine. However, he is interrupted by Death Star, who has decided that he's had enough and he is just going to use some sort of futuristic ray gun to end Wildstar's life. However, Jumpstar tries to protest. She doesn't want to see Wildstar die. She begs Deathstar to stop and give him another chance. Wildstar, however, still defiant, says that nothing is going to change. So Deathstar decides to pull the trigger and hit Wildstar with a burst of energy. We then see that Jumpstar is very angry by this and tries to attack Deathstar, uh, kind of indicating that her attraction to Wildstar is more than just a physical one, that she actually does care for his well-being to some extent. Uh, Death Star says that she needs to calm down, that this was necessary to end the fight, and that, you know, her feelings should not get in the way of the job that they had to do. And the two of them continue to argue until they are interrupted by Free Zone, who has seen that Wildstar, while taking the blast, is still not out of the fight and very much alive. Uh, he begins to get back up when they are all interrupted by this spectral being appearing. Uh, Wildstar believes that this being is the true Wildstar, the one that he has seen in his dreams and who was told about him in prophecy. 
but it's not the case as we're going to find out on the next page. We find out on the next page that this being's name is actually Skylark, and that this is not the first time that she and Wildstar have met because apparently Wildstar is stuck in a time loop, and that it's not good for the integrity of the universe for this to be happening, but that he has the ability to end this, as Skylark tells him that he has to go into the past to prevent this from happening. Death Star is convinced that this is just gibberish and that it's impossible because the time machine that Wildstar has is apparently only able to teleport non-organic materials through time. However, Wildstar informs him that the chip that he's put into, or I guess the floppy disk, into the time machine is supposed to override that. Uh, Death Star believes that this is impossible. However, Wildstar decides to activate the time machine, and we see a huge flash of green light appear, and this any sound effect going across as the battle is suddenly put on hold while the time machine is doing whatever future science tech stuff that it's doing. Then suddenly, on the next page, we are teleported to today, a.k.a. the present of 1993. If it seems a little bit jarring and you're not sure what's exactly happening, that's because the book's a little bit cryptic in the way that it starts off and just throws you into some sort of battle where you're not really certain what any of the characters' motivations are, but it does kind of come back and explain these things later on in the next few issues. However, it's really just kind of a what the heck is going on scenario in this first issue. Uh, we see the Skytech lab and inside we are introduced to Mickey, who is a college student on semester break and his father works at Skytech. Uh, Dennis tells Mickey that his dad's in his office, who is currently talking to another I guess scientist whose name is Don that works at another lab. Uh, Mickey says to tell Don hi. Uh, Mickey's dad continues to speak with Don, but then they're inter interrupted by a rumbling type of a tremor. And they realize that the whole building is shaking and they believe that it's an earthquake. Don suddenly cuts off from the phone as it's apparently much worse at his office Mickey yells at his dad to get under the doorway for safety. However, as quickly as it started, it's over. And they look to see what the seismic readings are, but they realize then that it wasn't an earthquake at all, and there was no actual seismic activity from any of the nearby fault lines. Uh, this catches them off guard, and they wonder if it was instead some type of an explosion or some other kind of anomaly that could have caused the entire building to rumble the way that it did. However, their conversation is interrupted by another person in the lab who yells down to Mickey's father and tells him that he has a very urgent phone call. Mickey's dad goes into his office to take the call as Mickey and Dennis continue to try and figure out exactly what's going on as they check the Richter scale readings and find out that there was an 8.2 registered on the Richter scale, despite the fact that this was not caused by any seismic activity. Uh, they continue to discuss whether or not it could potentially be something like antimatter, which is hilarious that Mickey's bringing that up just off the top of his head. However, Dennis doesn't believe that that, may, that, that was the cause. Uh, they're then interrupted by this woman who tells them that this is enough with the scientific mumbo jumbo and that they need to get to the source of this problem to find out if there are any people who need help. I find this odd as they work in a high-tech science lab and she's wearing a lab coat, which would imply that she's one of the scientists and or researchers that's working there, which means their whole day is filled with quote-unquote scientific mumbo-jumbo. Why is she all of a sudden having a problem with the two of them discussing high-level science in a lab where that's the entire point of its existence. However, their conversation is once again interrupted as Mickey's dad opens the door to his office and states that he's been on the phone with none other than the President of the United States, 
who wants their lab to mobilize and go to the source of the quote-unquote explosion. Mickey doesn't understand what's going on as he and his dad are walking down the hallway. And then his father informs him that Don's lab, which is Inter-SC Labs, has completely disappeared off the map and that they have to get there ASAP to figure out what the heck is going on. On the next page, we see a helicopter flying over the blast zone as we see that the lab has in fact been obliterated. Inside of the chopper, a general with the U.S. military is wondering how the Russians were able to get their hands on a device that could do this. However, Mickey's dad states that the Russians are no longer their enemy anymore. Mickey also chimes in saying, hasn't he read the papers? Uh, the general says that he doesn't believe anything he reads. However, Mickey then interjects saying that it must make bathrooms a real challenge for him. Uh, which it is kind of funny to think that, you know, now in the future, we're having problems with Russia once again between tensions with the Ukraine and the U.S. and all of that stuff. I guess, you know, everything old becomes new again. Uh, also, I'd like to point out, what the heck is Mickey even doing on this mission? One would only assume that this is a high-level, top-priority government mission and a matter of absolute national security. So why on earth was the lab director's kid just allowed to tag along? He can't possibly have any kind of security clearance. Uh, we see the team then mobilize and put out whatever the heck this thing is to start running tests and gain readings from the surrounding area. Uh, we see one of the members of the lab talking to Mickey's father, telling him that there are radiation levels present, which Mickey's father then realizes that he can confirm that it was a nuclear blast that caused this. However, his associate then tells him that the radiation levels present would suggest that the nuclear blast that caused this happened 30 years ago. We then see Mickey go off on his own to investigate, and then a little ways away, we see that Wildstar is unconscious as he wakes up wondering if he was able to accomplish his goal of time travel. We then see Wildstar stagger to his feet as he approaches one of the mercenaries that was fighting with him in the future. Uh, Mickey observes what's going on from behind a wall, not letting his presence be known. As we see Wildstar grab the still groggy combatant and decide that he's going to apparently just kill him as he rips the parasite off of his back with a bunch of skin coming with it, blood's pouring out everywhere. He throws the parasite down and then apparently his force blast has had enough time to recharge as he decides to obliterate the parasite. Mickey then comes out, lets his present be known, uh, but Wildstar recognizes him, oddly enough, once again, playing into the whole time loop aspect of the story, as he calls out Mickey's name, but apparently is so wiped out from traveling through time and also exerting himself with the force blast that he falls over onto the ground unconscious again. However, the sound of the force blast apparently was enough to gain the attention of the general and the rest of the scientific team as they wonder what's going on and where Mickey's gotten off to, as we see Mickey crouch down to see if Wildstar is okay. As Mickey tries to roll Wildstar over, the star parasite on Wildstar's chest lifts up and reaches out towards Mickey, uh, and makes kind of a hissing sound. This, of course, scares the living poop out of Mickey. Why wouldn't it? Uh, this is also the first instance that we get to see the parasite on Wildstar's chest exhibit its own sentience and that it can operate independently of Wildstar. Wildstar then awakens suddenly and grabs Mickey's hand. Mickey wants answers, wants to know how Wildstar knew his name, but Wildstar states that there's no time to explain any of that. He needs Mickey to get him to Turtle Rock so that they can prevent the calamity of his future from ever occurring. Mickey seems hesitant to try and help out this stranger. 
However, Wildstar persists in telling him that the fate of the entire world and possibly the universe rest on them being able to prevent the horrible calamity that caused the dystopian future that he's from. Mickey seems rather shocked by this entire exchange, why wouldn't he be, and decides to go along with Wildstar's plan and help him to his feet. We see once again the Parasite try to reach out towards Mickey. Wildstar tells the Parasite to settle down, that he, you know, should remember Mickey, that that's a friend of theirs. And we see the two of them walk arm in arm as Mickey helps Wildstar to the military trucks that are parked near the destroyed rubble of the building. We then see that the rest of the science team approaches from the other side to where Mickey and Wildstar just were. And then Mickey's father finds the time machine that Wildstar used to get back to this time and tries to inspect it and figure out what it is because obviously he wouldn't know what a time machine looks like. But before Mickey's father has any time to investigate the machine any further, it suddenly disappears. This kind of infuriates Mickey's dad as he has no idea what's going on and yells out, Mickey, where are you? Um, fortunately, that's when they hear the truck start up as they all run towards the vehicle as it drives away, his father yelling out Mickey, the general wanting to know what the heck is going on. However, they are then interrupted by none other than the mercenaries who are after Wildstar as we see that things might be going downhill for the science team as they've got to contend with all of these ne'er-do-wells as the story ends on this page for this issue, and it's to be continued. On the next page, we get a letter from the two creators of this book, Alan Gordon and Jerry Ordway, both of them expressing a lot of gratitude to the other members of Image who have been very encouraging to them and given them a platform to create a book of their own. And it's very you know, lollipops and rainbows in this section. However, from what I've read, Gordon and Ordway had a lot of turmoil between the two of them. And apparently there was a lot of infighting about the direction that they were going to go with the character and who exactly owned the rights to everything and that sort of thing, which may explain why Wildstar was such a short-lived book overall. Um, there's only seven issues in total. There's the four issue miniseries that starts it out. And then there's three issues of an ongoing series and that's it. That's where it ends. Uh, I only have the miniseries, which I will do videos on all four issues of that. And hopefully I can find the three issues of the ongoing series at some point to finish it out. Uh, on the next page, we then see an advertisement for entertainment this month, a place where you can mail away to order comic books which I guess is probably good at the time if you didn't have a very good comic book store near you and were primarily only buying from newsstands, but it's kind of an antiquated business model at this point that has been thoroughly replaced by eBay and other such sites. On the next page, we see an advertisement for Bloodstrike Number 1. If you'd like to know more about Bloodstrike Number 1, feel free to check out my video on Bloodstrike Number 1. And then we see an advertisement for the Protectors. I don't have any issues of the Protectors, though I would really like to find some simply for how frequently a Protectors advertisement has appeared in these early image books. I'd like to know a little bit more about it. Uh, you know, was it any good or was it really more of just a traditional superhero team up comic book? Uh, currently, I have no idea as I've never in my life seen a single issue of the Protectors or had the chance to, you know, read one and find anything out about the story. On the next page, we see an advertisement for Stormwatch. If you'd like to know more about Stormwatch, feel free to check out my Stormwatch playlist. And then an advertisement for Bloodwolf. If you'd like to know more about Bloodwolf, feel free to check out my videos on both Darker Image number one and Bloodwolf number one. And here on the final page of the book, we see an advertisement for Dinosaurs for Hire. Now, I was able to pick up like 
five or six issues of Dinosaurs for Hire a few months ago, and I'm probably going to do some videos on those eventually. However, I should point out that the issues of Dinosaurs for Hire I have are not the ones that were printed by Malibu Comics. They're from the previous publisher whose name escapes me at this point. I'm sorry. And they're all in black and white. I don't know if the Malibu printed ones were also in black and white or if they were in color. Uh, but nonetheless, I still want to get into it because it is a really kind of a fun goofball book of just dinosaur slash mercenary slash a team type of book. It's, it's unique and I, I appreciate it for being so unique. And here on the reverse inside cover, we once again see the advertisement for the one nine one nine hundred numbers that have appeared in multiple books from this time period that were getting printed in image or the image was printing up. Uh, you know, comic news, what's in store, nothing like paying two dollars a minute to just find out what's in your local comic book store. Gosh, I'm so glad that these kind of don't exist anymore. And that was Wildstar number one. As I stated earlier, there are only seven issues of Wildstar that exist, which I find unfortunate because I actually really liked this book a lot. Uh, I thought the story was rather unique, uh, especially compared to the rest of what the image universe at that time was doing. Uh, the whole time travel aspect, the stuck in a time loop type of thing, uh, the different parasites that gave the characters different abilities and quote unquote superpowers. Uh, I thought it was a really, you know, standout title in what was otherwise, you know, books that were, you know, trying to stand out in terms of the way that image creators were doing things, but were also very reminiscent of that which was already being done in the early 90s. Uh, I felt like Wildstar was just, you know, cut from a different cloth in that aspect. But then again, those are just my opinions. You may not have liked Wildstar at all and thought it was the worst comic book you've ever read, uh, or maybe you've never heard about Wildstar until today. But if you enjoyed today's video, please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. And thanks for stopping by. Have a great day.